Hello, everybody, and welcome to... I just blanked. Uh, the... I don't remember the module. It's the back half of Unit 3, though. I can promise you that. First of all, I'd like to apologize for my stuffy nose. I've done my best to get rid of that, and uh, this... We're all just going to have to deal with it now. Sorry. So, why is there a focus here? Why are we stopping here to discuss end of life? A couple of reasons. Uh, I find that this is an area that students struggle with a lot, and honestly, professionals struggle with a lot. It's just not something that's discussed very much. And if you're working in the gerontological community, you are going to experience this. You are going to have patients that die. Honestly, you're going to have patients that die in almost every circumstance, but definitely within geriatric care, there will be patients that die. Uh, so I think it merits discussion. Also, the role the dietitian takes in end-of-life care in, again, in, in geriatrics is really rather different. It's not what you would normally think of within your job task duties. It's not like your official duties change, but what you can do and what you should do, if you will, change. Excuse me. We're going to go over some definitions here, and it's not so much that the definitions are different. If you have worked in, in, in uh, any kind of end-of-life situation, you can be very familiar with these terms, but the context is a bit different in this circumstance. Okay, so all, all of that preamble out of the way, uh, let, let's get into it. So we're going to discuss here uh, a terminal condition, and that's the obviously the prerequisite for a hospice care or end-of-life care, uh, is an illness that can't be cured or treated. A terminal in, uh, illness, blah, or condition, I should say, a terminal condition, is one that it's kind of vaguely defined. It's defined as an illness or condition that can't be cured or treated and that a patient can reasonably be expected to die from within six months if no other interventions are taken. This is assuming the disease is allowed to run its normal course. Six months is fairly arbitrary. I mean, you got to draw the line somewhere, right? Uh, what typically happens in long-term care is that you will run into a situation when you have somebody that needs to re-up. Well, the, it, it, the case is revisited every six months, I guess is how I'll describe that. So uh, the doctor declares, person is has a terminal condition, hospice care is appropriate, in six months, if they have not passed away, the care team will reevaluate if hospice care is still appropriate, and there frequently is, and the hospice care will just be continued and reevaluated every six months. It is not uncommon for people to live in, in long-term care or geriatric care. It is not uncommon for people to live several years with a terminal condition. Again, we, we don't know. We're, we're all just taking a guess here. So... We just reevaluate. Uh, the exa the example here of um, a it could go either way. With this is a um, twenty seven year old HIV positive patient. They're not really terminal because uh, while if the HIV becomes AIDS, that is terminal. Um, the normal course of care will allow a HIV positive patient to live a fairly normal lifespan. I almost right back up there with a normal lifespan at this point. So if the if the condition is treated, you know, this 27 year old is looking at another 50 years. So it's not necessarily a terminal condition. They could decide that they don't want to treat it and then it might become a terminal condition. Probably not a HIV positive when they become when they become AIDS positive. I think my, my explanation may have made it worse. But we will continue and see if I can clarify some more. Okay, so advanced directives are uh, the statements of patients' wishes to be used in the event that they're not able to speak for themselves. Uh, this is in conjunction with several other things we'll discuss. In the U.S., it's a legal document. I believe that... Um, other countries also have this. I don't know about everywhere, obviously. But in the U.S., this is a legally binding document. Your wishes are to be honored by the care team. Sometimes it's called a living will. 
sometimes, and we'll get into it later, there is somebody to speak for that patient. Heroic measures are uh, radical, intensive, or high-risk interventions. Heroic measures are always taken with the understanding that anything, anything else is likely to fail at this point. We are at the end zone. We're, you know, we're at end times. There is nothing left to be done except this, maybe. Uh, they're often very high risk. Even doing the treatment itself may have a high risk of comorbidity or death to it. But again, we're last, last stand. Uh, things like a very invasive emergency surgery, a very high dose of IV, and IV? Yes, IV antibiotics are things that are considered heroic measures. Uh, hospice versus palliative care. We're going to discuss both these. We're going to compare and contrast hospice and palliative in just a little bit. Hospice ca uh, care is comfort care for patients facing a terminal illness. So you do have to be declared to have a terminal condition to qualify for hospice care. Um, in hospice care, it's a, uh, there is no curative plan or treatment pursued. At this point, the only, the only goal is comfort. And it's a more of a holistic approach. It is a approach that involves uh, faith, you know, like faith leaders, spiritual guidance, psychological guidance, uh, legal counseling for to prepare for the uh, eventual outcome to make sure that affairs are in order, the funeral home is prepared, people know what we know what wants to be, what the patient wants done with their remains, things like that. It, it's a very holistic thing. It involves the family. Uh, palliative care is comfort care. It provides relief, um, physical and mental, and this can be uh, you know pain meds or say anti-anxiety medication or uh, psychological counseling it's for patients facing severe or life-limiting illnesses. Treatment can still be pursued if somebody's on a palliative care. Uh, course, it doesn't mean that they're not seeking treatment any longer, but it does mean that we're putting a priority on comfort. And it should be noted that palliative care is a bit descriptive. Taking a Tylenol is palliative care. Kissing your kids a boo-boo to make it feel better is palliative care. Anything that makes the patient feel better qualifies as palliative care. It's just that when they're on a palliative care course, the primary goal is comfort Treatment is kind of secondary. I, I was going to ask you that's clear, but you can't tell me. Uh, DNR is a do not resuscitate. It's a legal order that forbids medical caregivers to perform any kind of CPR, you know, basic life-saving, advanced life-saving. All of that's just that person. A DNR means don't. Just, just stop. Um, in long-term care, uh, which is a, a big part of geriatric care. In geriatric care in general, you'll often see a OOH DNR, which is an out-of-hospital do not resuscitate. There was a time when this legal document did not exist, and you actually, I'm speaking again as someone who has seen this happen, you actually had to provide, if you found a resident who was dead, you had to call 911, perform CPR on them until they got to the hospital, and then a doctor could come out and declare them dead, or a, a nurse could come out and declare them dead due to the DNR. The uh, out-of-hospital DNR means that instead of having to do this, uh, if you happen to come in and see a patient who was no longer with us, you just turn off the lights, close the door, and then go tell the charge nurse to call the family. Sometimes this is also called um, an AND, or allow natural death. Um, I always see AND noted in different documentation. I have never seen an AND. Uh, actually, I'm kind of curious. If any of y'all have an AND where you live, let me know. I, I would love to know where this is because I've never actually seen it as a legal document. And I can, I've been everywhere. I can attest to Texas, New Mexico, Missouri, Mississippi, and North Carolina as places that I have done some of this. No one has ever talked about an AND. Let me know. I'm curious. Um, there are some ethical debates involved with DNR. Some of it's kind of like, what, well, what's covered under DNR? Because it is made clear that with DNRs and hospice care, um, while we are allowing a natural death to take place, we're not necessarily um, just, you know, we're not just stopping everything. 
the ones that are often given examples are things like if you break a bone, we're not just going to leave it there. We're obviously, you're going to have it set and get pain medication for it. Uh, if you have an infection, you're going to get an antibiotic for it. Um, but that does kind of bring up questions like, uh, well, dialysis. Um, if you had a patient in total kidney failure and they just stopped, and, and that has happened to me. I have had patients that are just like, I, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I really don't want to do this anymore. Uh, it doesn't take long typically, um, or a pacemaker. Uh, if somebody has heart conditions, uh, is a pacemaker appropriate in a DNR situation? Eh. Uh, it's, it's kind of vague. It's a little bit gray. Um, another problem with DNR is the uh, racial divergence of DNRs. And a lot of this we think is due to cultural influences. Um, about half of white patients in long-term or in healthcare facilities have a DNR. About a quarter of black patients and about 20% of Hispanic patients have DNRs. Why, generally speaking, within the uh, elder care community, DNRs are, are recognized as a beneficial, better thing for people. Uh, it's because of the potential outcomes or comorbidities involved with life-saving interventions. It's generally considered to be better to have a DNR, have a palliative care track, and allow them to live comfortably versus intensive interventions. Uh, other questions that have come up, um, you know, if somebody who has a DNR and they're saying, I don't want any kind of treatment, I don't want any kind of intervention, and so the question has come up, well, what's the difference between that and a suicide? I, I told you, we're, we're getting into deep, dark territory here. So it, it only gets grayer from here. Uh, but yeah, so if somebody can say, I don't want life-saving treatment versus I want to die, um, what is the boundary there? Um, and, and really, all, all suggestions are on the table, whether we're discussing... Uh, a cultural issue, whether we're discussing somebody's religious beliefs, all of these are on the table. All, all of this matters. What about dementia? What about somebody who says something like, I don't want life-saving care, and then as their dementia progresses, they indicate something like they haven't, said they, they haven't wanted to be fed. Then as their dementia progresses, they indicate that they're hungry. What do we do? Uh, and these aren't, I'm not here to answer these questions because they don't have answers yet. This is very much up in the air. Um, so going back to a little more concrete stuff here for you. Uh, power of attorney. And this is something that comes up a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the uh, power of attorney, the POA, is a legal order authorizing another individual to act as a legal representative. They have the authority to conduct uh, legal affairs, business affairs, private affairs of the estate of that individual. They can have a durable power. They can have, there can be a durable power of attorney. A power of attorney can be um, limited in scope or time for like as long. The patient can say, as long as I am unable to make decisions, this person speaks in my behalf. The uh, durable power of attorney can be like for a limited time for this event or a durable one can be forever. This person speaks for me unless I say otherwise. The uh, power of attorney can be rescinded at any point by the grantor. So um, the kinds of situations you see where a really sinister, in the movies where a sinister, I don't know, son-in-law takes over and like bilks the estate and traps this poor old little lady in a asylum. That can't happen. Pretty particularly easily, as long as the person has not been declared to be mentally incompetent, uh, they always have the power to fire their power of attorney. Um, also, um, the POA cannot override any last wishes as far as advanced directives, living wills. They don't have the power to change those. So again, all they can they have they have a rather limited scope in what they can do. It's not nearly as expansive as people often think it is. Okay, so the medical power of attorney is a different one. Um, 
sometimes a power of attorney is also given medical power of attorney. And honestly, if there is no declared medical power of attorney, the power of attorney often gets both. Uh, the medical power of attorney has a legal authorization to make medical decisions on another's behalf in case they're incapacitated. Uh, it may be limited to specific circumstances. It's, it's Their reach and ability to control things is exactly as broad as the POAs, as far as only as long as the grantor allows it. It may be in limited circumstances, and the uh, medical power of attorney cannot override last wishes as far as if there's a documented set of them, then... Um, they can't override those. And it should be noted that a grant that as when I say documented, I don't mean here is my last living will and testament written out and signed by a lawyer. I mean, if say you, the clinician are in a room and you hear the patient say, I want X, then you talk to the care plan team coordinator um, or the, the uh, social workers that's documented. You are a witness to that event that is then documented in the medical chart. That is a documented uh, living will. They are also responsible for HIPAA management. Now, if you remember HIPAA, HIPAA is the law that says you can't share private information. If the patient is not able to declare who can share information, the uh, medical power of attorney decides who gets to know what when. The only person that maybe gets to know is the power of attorney because they may have to pay the bills. So they're, they're going to have to know what's going on. You can't just send them a blank bill saying, please pay us some monies because they'll want to know why. All right, so uh, sometimes these are referred to as agents, which is kind of cool. Um, they're often two different people with, you know, with kind of they have different jobs, if you will. Um, the POA maintains the estate and handles financial and legal affairs. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as the financial power of attorney, but usually it's just the power of attorney. The um, medical power of attorney manages the patient's care. So again, power of attorney responsible for the, the estate, essentially paying bills, making sure legal obligations are met, making sure other people's legal obligations to the patient are met. Medical power of attorney manages the patient's care. That is a brief overview of definitions. I will catch you in the next one where we go into more detail on hospice versus palliative care. And until then, have a good one. Bye.